is a place in the Pacific Northwest where whales, fish, birds, and people all come together. This is Puget Sound. Puget Sound is an oasis of wilderness in the midst of development. Only steps away from the skyscrapers of Seattle, one can encounter sea lions, bald eagles, and killer whales. Wildlife and people alike are drawn there for the same reason, the quality of life. In the northwest corner of America, a shining sliver of the Pacific Ocean creates a place unlike any other in the world. This is Puget Sound, where fresh water from the mountains tumbles into the salty sea. It's a rich mix of waters that attracts all kinds of wildlife. The spirit of Puget Sound, the orca. Families of these killer whales have made the sound their home for generations. Orcas thrive here because of the sound's special bounty, a gift many animals need to survive, including the mighty bald eagle. That gift is salmon, and Native Americans have relied on it for centuries. Indian leader, Billy Frank. It's very important to our lives that that salmon is here. There we're salmon people here in Puget Sound. We live and talk salmon. We joke about salmon. We, we, we draw salmon. We paint salmon. We, we, Salmon's on our totem pole, telling a story about the salmon. So we try to talk for the salmon and tell the people how important the salmon is to the quality of life in the Northwest. Salmon flourish in Puget Sound because of its proximity to the Pacific Ocean. Greater Puget Sound is a huge estuary made up of straits, inlets, and bays. But it wasn't these rich waters that lured European settlers to the Northwest. It was big timber. Early settlers felled the ancient forests and dammed the rivers. The effect on the streams and the salmon was devastating. Today, Seattle, a cosmopolitan city of three million, sits on the banks of Puget Sound, and people are still coming. But these more recent arrivals are echoing the sentiments of the Native Americans. They too feel a link with their surroundings and are taking steps to stop the wildlife and salmon from disappearing. 
In the last 20 years, many laws have been passed to clean up pollution and save habitats. Yet the challenge of protecting wildlife becomes more difficult as more and more people crowd these shores. And even people's best efforts don't always work out as planned. When dams blocked salmon runs, the city intervened and built fish ladders. The ladders give six species of Pacific salmon a fighting chance to make it upriver to their spawning grounds. But this artificial route has attracted a new danger. It's light entertainment for downtown Seattle tourists to watch California sea lions devour steelhead salmon. Salmon gather in this narrow passageway of Ballard Locks, waiting their turn to enter the fish ladder. It's a terrific find for sea lions. Until recently, sea lions weren't the only ones fishing here. Two Native American tribes, the Muckleshoot and the Suquamish, have traditional rights to fish this salmon run. But they found the sea lion was a formidable competitor. The sea lions learned that fishermen's nets meant an easy meal. They set up territories to keep other animals away from their nets. One adult can eat 10 steelhead salmon a day. Their voracious appetites endangered this particular run. The Native Americans realized that there were not enough salmon for both sea lions and themselves, and so they stepped aside, allowing the sea lions full run of these waters. Sea lions aren't entirely to blame for the disappearing salmon. Human development has played a big part in destroying salmon streams. There's hardly any place left for the remaining fish to breed. In response to declining stocks, salmon are raised in hatcheries and released into the wild. Another approach to saving salmon is to save their rivers. In the last 10 years, school children have transformed these devastated waters into a thriving salmon run. The Adopt a Stream Foundation encourages local communities to get involved. Okay, we're gonna go try this now. Don't run, watch out for the rocks and the mud. Please stay out of the water. These children are from Jackson Elementary School, and they've come here on a special mission. The children carry bags of tiny fish, salmon they have raised from eggs. Now it's time to release their fish into the stream. I named my fish after flowers, and I named them Daisy, Snowflake, and Daffodil. A long time ago, it's just garbage, and now we've cleaned it all up, and it looks really nice. The kids at Jackson have learned that each one of them makes a difference, and that this one stream 
can make a lot of difference in the, the whole aspect of environment. These kids are not going to be the non-caring people of the future. They, they know that no matter where they go, that there's something they can do and that every little bit they do does help. During the autumn and winter months, Pacific salmon return to their place of birth to spawn. They find their way by following the unique smells of their native stream. It's an exhausting journey. Upon entering fresh water, they stop eating and survive off their fat reserves. The female searches the stream for an appropriate site to dig her nest. Over the next few days, she'll lay up to 5,000 eggs. The male shudders, fertilizing the eggs with his sperm. The female will guard the nest against other salmon, but can't defend her eggs from bigger predators. Spawning signals the end of their life's journey. Their carcasses provide an abundance of food for crows during the meager winter months. Many animals time their appearance to these crucial salmon runs. These lofty visitors survey the pickings. Bald eagles come from as far away as Alaska to feed on winter runs of chum salmon. Puget Sound is one of the few places in North America where bald eagles gather by the hundreds. People gather here too, but they're not interested in fish. Each week, hundreds of bird lovers trek through the near freezing temperatures for a look at these magnificent birds of prey. Just 20 years ago, DDT nearly wiped out the entire bald eagle population in Puget Sound. With a ban on DDT and full protection under the Endangered Species Act, the bald eagle is making a comeback. Wary by nature, bald eagles prefer streams and rivers away from people, but their presence attracts an audience. Eagle watchers even come by water to witness this spectacle. A small rafting industry has grown up. A lot of boats, however, can disturb eagles and drive them from their feeding grounds. <laughs> to protect the birds they come to see, people visit only at midday, when most eagles have fed and are resting. It's a compromise that works out for the eagles and their admirers.
In spring, young salmon wash down river and begin their journey to the Pacific Ocean. That journey runs an obstacle course of human development. Rivers that once meandered through forests are now lined with concrete. Docks and warehouses have replaced the marshes where young fish used to feed. When the salmon finally enter the sound, the great blue heron is waiting for them. Mergansers also hunt young salmon. On their way to their breeding grounds, the birds feed voraciously, building up fat reserves for the long flight north. The Greater Puget Sound Basin is a meeting place for countless rivers and streams. The tide ebbs and flows over mudflats rich in organic matter. Green snails come out at low tide to feed on the rich sediment. Green-winged teals and other ducks sift the mud for nutritious algae. The congregation of waterfowl attracts larger winged predators, such as the jeer falcon. The falcon is looking for one weak link in a chain of thousands of shorebirds. It's the millions of crustaceans, clams, and worms in the mudflats that lure the birds down from their migration routes. Mudflats are shrinking as cities expand, but a greater threat comes from a saltwater grass introduced from the east coast, Spartina. Spartina grows well in shallow water, developing quickly into a thick, high marsh. It was introduced by people who believe this plant was good habitat for waterfowl, but birds don't eat it and it replaces native marsh plants that they do eat. So far, nothing can stop this ever-growing threat. Snow geese arrive for the winter. They come from the Arctic, returning from as far away as Siberia. But some discover major changes in their salt marsh homes.
Most of the Sound salt marshes have been drained and turned into farmland. But the geese are adaptable and have taken up residence on the farms, eating winter grasses and wheat. They're a noisy bunch, but their cries are actually a welcome sound to farmers. When snow geese graze, they trim the foliage, keeping the crop healthy and more resistant to viruses. Plus, the birds provide plenty of free fertilizer. The extraordinary numbers of birds bring out people by the carloads. But a large crowd can agitate the geese, causing tension within the flock. If someone gets too close, the birds will panic. Frantic takeoffs can kill some of the geese. And there's another threat, this time from the sky. The bald eagle wants to panic the flock. An injured goose will be an easy target. Within a few minutes, the huge flock descends. Without sighting an easy target, the bald eagle returns to his perch. Despite the loss of the salt marshes, this flock of snow geese numbers more than 40,000. They've settled easily on these newly made farmlands. But the geese still face another threat. Farmland is being subdivided for houses. Government wildlife agencies have stepped in to protect the snow geese. They plan to purchase farmlands so that geese and other wildlife can feed securely. Padilla Bay, four square miles of pristine waters and marsh. Black brant geese flock here to feed on their favorite food, eelgrass. Elsewhere in Puget Sound, eelgrass meadows are vanishing fast. 
Padilla Bay has been made into a reserve to protect this precious habitat. Brant geese usually bob for eelgrass beneath the water's surface, but when winter storms wash the grass to the shore, the brants follow. Under the water, the eelgrass meadows come alive. Algae growing on eelgrass is food for all kinds of marine creatures. Nudibranchs graze here, and some are unique to Padilla Bay. There are plenty of snails for a hungry sea star. The snail escapes just in the nick of time. The open maw of a hooded sea slug waits for floating plankton drifting along the current. Copepods provide meals for a variety of fish that find shelter here. Once the keen-eyed stickleback sights its prey, the chase is on. Bay pipefish mimic eelgrass to hide from larger predators. The snake prickleback is distracted from hunting worms by a wandering copepod. The anemone catches plankton with its tentacles, tentacles that also provide protection. But the anemone's stinging tentacles don't impress everyone. This nudibranch is immune to the stings. It eats the tentacles and absorbs the toxins to use for its own defense. Anemones also have a tender side. This one broods its young on its body. And when the adult is attacked, the young, too, are in jeopardy. If their parent is in danger, the young anemone has an escape plan. It bails out, escaping on the current. The young anemone needs to grab a blade of eelgrass for protection. The ones that miss are doomed. Offshore, the deep waters of Puget Sound hide even stranger creatures.
Here, rock crabs and starry flounders dominate these dark depths. And a large predator stirs up the mud in search of prey. Commercial divers spend hours each day stalking the dark, muddy bottom for a strange but abundant animal. Using a pressure hose, they blow away silt from a burrowing gooey duck. In some areas of the sound, gooey ducks are so plentiful, divers may take a thousand pounds in just a few hours. Gooey ducks are giants of the clam world. Also known as king clams, they may grow to lengths of 30 inches and weigh as much as 14 pounds. And they can live for 120 years. It wasn't until the 1930s that vast beds containing millions of gooey ducks were discovered in Puget Sound. Now, they're served as a delicacy and have become expensive items in sushi bars. Unfortunately, many of the beds cannot be harvested because of high levels of pollution. The harvesting of future gooey duck generations will depend on how clean the waters of Puget Sound can be kept. And new housing developments built right on the water add to the problem. If harvest sites are kept free of contamination, the big clams are able to replenish their numbers through natural spawning. Eggs and sperm ejected from the adults eventually unite, forming new colonies. Rising from the sediment plains of the undersea world of Puget Sound are forests of kelp. And where kelp surrounds islands, orcas come in to hunt. These killer whales hunt in teams. They coordinate their movements with complex calls. Several pods of orcas live in Greater Puget Sound year-round. They know every bay and inlet and all the best fishing spots. They have special beaches where they rub in the sand and they rest in the shelter of certain islands.
Islands provide a retreat for people too. They come seeking the same thing that's important to wildlife, isolation. This is Protection Island, a recently established sanctuary for breeding seabirds. A residential development was once planned here. The island was subdivided, bulldozed, overgrazed, and burned. But there was no fresh water here, and the development failed, leaving the island to its wild inhabitants. In spring, 5,000 pairs of glaucous-winged gulls vie for nesting territories. Males tenaciously defend the nest site chosen by their mate. When ready to hatch, the chick calls out from the egg to announce its arrival. With so many nests in the gull colony, parents must be able to identify their own young. The pair learns to recognize their chicks by the pattern of spots on their heads. To be fed successfully, the chick must learn the call of its parents. If they beg a meal from another gull in a nearby territory, they could be viciously attacked. Pigeon guillemots also rely on Protection Island as a safe place to raise their young. The oyster catcher nests here too. In all, eight species breed on the island, 70% of all Puget Sound seabirds. Pigeon guillemots don't nest in colonies, but as individual pairs. Anywhere they can find a suitable site. Driftwood piled up high by winter storms provides a perfect nesting place. The chicks remain in the nest for 35 days while their parents feed them one fish at a time. Protection Island has no ground predators to worry the nesting birds. Trouble comes in on the wing. Bald eagles cause panic in the colony. An adult pair and eight juvenile eagles make their seasonal home here. The nesting colonies are easy hunting grounds.
Havoc and disruption assist the crows. When all eyes of the colony are on the attacking eagles, they're quick to exploit the chaos. Courage is mustered in the colony once the eagle flies off with its prey and the crows are quickly chased away. The solitude of these islands is also important to a creature from the sea, the harbor seal. Harbor seals haul out in large numbers to rest and breed. For a few hours a day, they become landlubbers. These idle hours serve an important purpose. When diving, seals depend on the oxygen stored in their blood. When that oxygen supply is exhausted, they must come to the surface to recharge. It can take several hours for their blood to regain the oxygen level that will enable them to dive again. In the 1970s, a rash of stillbirths was discovered in these seals. Biologists linked these disturbing deaths to high levels of pollution. John Colombo Kitas of Cascader Research is conducting a long-term study of pollutants in marine animals. All of my research on uh, pollutants in both fish and seals stem from a belief that by learning more about the presence of these pollutants in the environment, we could take more effective action to improve the environment. The good news is that levels of PCBs and DDT have declined substantially in harbor seals in the last 18 years. This is partly due to legislation prohibiting industrial and agricultural uses of these dangerous chemicals. Certainly the research on marine mammals and harbor seals has served as one of the reasons that there's been such an interest in cleaning up a lot of the marine waters, including Puget Sound. The progress is encouraging, but the battle isn't over. Modern industry discharges pesticides, metals, and other toxic substances into Puget Sound. And the growing population is responsible for the 300 million gallons of partially treated sewage entering the Sound every day. What overall effect this has on the food chain is unknown, but ultimately what's poured into the waters of this great estuary will affect the top predator of the region, the orca.
Many transient orcas visit these inland waters, but three family groups are considered residents, and they are being studied by biologist Ken Balcom and his associates. Having followed these orcas since 1976, Balcom is able to recognize all 92 resident individuals by sight. Each whale is identified by the shape of its dorsal fin and white saddle patch. In the spring and summer, the orcas are photographed. Births and deaths are noted, as well as the general health of each animal. One resident pod contains 56 animals, making it the largest family group of orcas in the world. Orcas may travel more than 100 miles a day with an energy that seems boundless. Their lives are centered around the pursuit of prey, specifically salmon. Males are larger than females with much taller dorsal fins, six feet high. But it's the female who leads the pod. A female can give birth every three years, or she may spend 10 years with one calf making the orca's family bond among the strongest in the world. In fact, orca males stay with their mothers for life. And these whales live a long time. A female may live up to 75 years, and males for 50. During the 1960s and 70s, orcas were captured from Puget Sound for display in aquariums. Local people rallied to protect the killer whales and pressured lawmakers to save them. Now they are protected, but the whales won't fully recover their numbers until the end of this century.
Over the years, people's perception of orcas has changed completely. Oh. Oh, wow. Once they were thought of as ruthless killers. Now, these whales are cherished. Whenever dorsal fins are sighted, a small flotilla gathers at a respectable distance. These orcas are living symbols of everything truly wild here, and they give Puget Sound a powerful spirit of freedom. It's a freedom a few abuse by getting too close. The people of Puget Sound enjoy an extraordinary quality of life. There are salmon in the nets, eagles overhead, and whales in the waters. All this natural abundance has given rise to a new spirit, a spirit of sharing. Puget Sound is a place where people are working very hard to live in harmony with their wild neighbors. Thank you.